everybody. Great to be here in Tasmania. Um, I was in my hotel room and I thought the roof was going to come off last night with the wind you've got around here. You know how to do wind well in, uh, in Hobart. It was uh, rattling and shaking and uh, I thought, wow, this could be interesting. But I was safe in bed and I'm alive this morning. So that's good. That's always a good sign when you wake up next morning and there's a roof over your head, isn't it? So uh, I actually, this is the first time I've been back to Tasmania in nearly 26 years. Um, I got, uh, I live in Sydney. Uh, and on April the 4th, 1998, I got married, and on April the 5th, 1998, I came to Tasmania for a 10-day honeymoon. So, this is, uh, we're, ne- we're nearly talking 26 years, and it has not disappointed me. Um, it's been so good to be back and to, uh, to be part of and see what's happening in, in Tasmania, but it's more important than that. It's been so good to actually be part of your church over these last couple of days. What an amazing group of people you are, and just to see your leadership yesterday, and uh, we'll see more of you this afternoon as we talk about a safe church. And can I say this to you? If you think can I bring my friends to church? I want to say, yes, you can. Because the stuff that's being put in place, the policies, the procedures, the heart says, we want this to be safe. We want to make sure our kids are safe. We want to make sure that everybody who comes through our doors is cared for, that they're looked after, that the, the leaders are screened to make sure that they are the right kind of people to, to do what they do. So um, I, it has been just such a blessing to be with, uh, I didn't get to see Pastor Sean, but Pastor Morella is an absolute legend. You have the best pastor, absolutely. Don't tell any of my ACC friends uh, that because they'll be most upset that I'm saying that C3 pastor is the best in Tasmania. So just let's keep that quiet. Keep that between you and I. So preaching is an absolute privilege. It's an an honour that I never take lightly. And uh, I have been a pastor for 30 years. I pastored a church in Western Sydney. Um, until 2015. I, uh, for those who are trying to work out my age, I'm 51. So I, I became an intern pastor at the age of 20 um, and uh, was in the same church from, uh, for the 20, 20 something years, started as the intern and was the senior pastor for 15 years. And so it's, it's just always an honour when someone else asks you to preach. And, uh, and I really don't take that lightly. So what I want to say is, first, let me pray. Because I just need the Holy Spirit to use me um, as I speak. Um, I'm just a vessel. Uh, but the important work is done when the Holy Spirit takes what I say and uses it to change your lives. So let's pray. Pray for me too. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and Uh, share your word. Lord, you know I don't take it lightly. You know, Father, that it is an incredible honor. And so I ask that you will use me, use my mouth, use my words, use, uh, Lord, everything about me that will bring honor. But Lord, more than that, I pray your Holy Spirit will do what you do so well. And Lord, that speak to people, that's changing lives. And Father, I just thank you that God, you are for us. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that each person here that you want to use and equipped for your purposes, in the name of Jesus. I really felt this morning as I uh, prepared to speak, and this is something that uh, uh, when I talked to uh, the team here, when I said, look, I'm happy to preach, and they said, that would be great. Um, and uh, I said, what, what would you like me to preach on? They said, well, the series is It Takes a Village. So in my preparation over the last couple of weeks, I've been seeking God and saying, Lord, what is it you want me? What part of that series do you want me to strengthen, I guess, speak into? And uh, God put a very strong word on my heart. And I want to say this to each of you, and I mean each of you, not just the person next to you. I want to say this to you. You are valuable. You are valuable important. You are gifted. You. You are gifted. God's got a call on your life. He does. Don't mess it up. You're special. You're created in his image. He has called you. Who you are. What you cry at, 
what you laugh at, what you like doing, what you don't like doing. He's created you to be who you are. And the good thing about a village is that not everyone is the same. A village, if everyone made bread and no one ran the petrol station and no one organised the clothing shop, you'd have a whole lot of naked people walking around eating bread. Because it takes a village. It takes a village. It takes someone to do something for the benefit of others. And that is who you are. You are someone called by God. Someone who God has said, I have made you. The Bible says, I have created you in your mother's womb. No accidents. You might have been a surprise to your parents, but you're certainly not an accident. You are you. And so understanding your place when you come to C3 Hobart And when you come to being a Christian living in the world, you need to understand who you are and what you are. Otherwise, you'll start to look around and say, well, I'm not like them and I can't do that. And when we think like that, it doesn't work for us. So I want to say this morning to you this. Jesus is looking for the one. For the one, the individual, the person, the you. Jesus is looking for the one, for the person just like you, just like you, in the situation you are in. Single, married, kids, no kids, whatever. In the house you live in, in the job that you do, in the neighborhood in which you live, can sing, can't sing. That's where I am. You've seen children wear earmuffs to church? I'm sure it's because they've heard that I'm coming. Because I can't sing. But that's okay. We are called. Each of us. Significant. We see in the Bible that when Jesus calls his first disciples... And we see that in Matthew chapter 4. It says that one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. And Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once, and they followed him. And a little further up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting up in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. And they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Jesus says to these men, fishermen, men who weren't the greatest status in the world, men who just were doing what they were called to do, He says, come and follow me. Come and be with me. And then he says, leave your past behind. Put your nets behind, leave them there. You won't be needing them at the moment. And then he says, I've got a mission for you. In the same way, when you become a Christian, Jesus does the same thing. He says, come and follow me. Come and find what it is to have a relationship with me. Come and find what it means to have security, to have love, to have peace. Come and sit with me. That's all he says. Come. No stipulations, no strings, no come and serve me and you. I'll get you to do all these things. No list of things to do. Just come and follow me. And then he says, get free of your past. So don't bring the stuff you did that you kind of feel like you're ashamed of or would would kind of make you uh, disqualified. No, no, leave that behind. You don't need that. You're not going to need that anymore. That's there. And then he says, come and find fulfillment in a purpose and a mission that I'm going to give you. 
Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. For we. We doesn't leave a lot of room. We means every single person. We doesn't mean for some people, for highly gifted people, for good-looking people, for people who can do all these things, for we, we, the person next to you, the person in front of you, the person beside you, 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 for we, it gives no one an out, for we are God's handiwork. I'm not much of a craft person, but there's a lady in my church who while I preach, or while anyone preaches, she knits. And I talk to her and she says, you know, that's the way she concentrates. And so that's great. But the things she knits and the things she makes. And I say, do you use a pattern? She goes, no. She said, I just, you know, top my head. I, sometimes I use green, sometimes I use blue. In the same way, God does that with you. When he made you, he didn't go, okay, where's my manual? And you become like the same person. He says, okay. Greg, I've got Greg here, all right. I'm going to make him and I'm shaping him like, just like that, that, that gets that clay and he makes that. Oh, I'm going to put a lip on this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to put a style there. Ah, isn't Greg great? Suzanne, oh, this time I'm going to do that. Belinda, I know what I'm exactly going to do with Belinda. He creates us. And he shapes us and he makes you. So when you walk in, you're walking into church this morning, you are all a different handiwork. You are all a different vessel. We are all God's handiwork created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. So my question to you this morning is this. What are the good works that Christ has designed for you to do. For you. You. You? Yeah, but I've got that deficiency. And oh, Have you ever seen a perfect pot? My wife loves tea, and so she's got some teapots, and I bought her something at Christmas, and it said on the label, it said... Um, due to these being handmade, there will be certain deficiencies or, or design. No one cup is the same. That is the same for you. Maybe the cup is not quite round, but you can still drink from it. You are God's handiwork. And a village is full of people who are made differently for one purpose. All of you are the same pot created differently for the same purpose. And that's to see a dying world who needs Jesus Christ, who needs someone who will show Jesus Christ, who will speak about Jesus Christ in your way. Some people will never stand on a, on a crate in the middle of a, a Hobart Mall and say, come to Jesus. But all of you, all of you have friends and people who can say and show the difference that Jesus makes. We are created, designed with a purpose. And you know what happens when we do that in a church? Someone, because of the power of one, gives their life to Jesus. Do you know what the Bible says? When someone comes to Jesus, they have a party. The whole of heaven. Not when it gets to 100, they ring a bell. When one, when one comes in the kingdom, the bell rings and they go, party time. Can you imagine heaven? It must be party time, party time, party time. For all of those who are introverts, you're going to have a hard time in heaven. Because it's going to be party, 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 party. One person. Because one person, because you, the vessel that God's created you to be, loved someone, spoke to them, invited them to church. And they make the best decision they've ever made in their lives. 
one person who gets here early and leaves when everyone else is gone because they've looked after the children. Not babysit them. They've come and they've done things with them. They've told them about Jesus and they've loved it and they've modeled it. And a child, we've seen a dedication this morning, says, you know what? I want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus. Because one, one person who probably we don't even know, you don't even see because they're out there, unless you're a parent. One person who says, I know what my gifting is. I know what I'm called to do. The power of one. One person who misses someone at church. Where's Annie this morning? I'm going to give her a ring. How are you, Annie? Oh, you're sick. Can I bring a food round to you? Oh, you want a meal? No problem. Oh, you're going to hospital tomorrow? I'll pick you up. Can I come and pray with you? One person. One person. You, you haven't gone to Bible college. You haven't, you haven't done all these things that maybe you think a pastor or a minister or someone should do. It doesn't matter because you are a pot that says... I can be an encourager. Someone who says, you know what? I'm just going to send messages randomly to people in church and just say, I'm praying for you today. Somebody who says, I'm not coming back to church again. And they meet you and they go, you know what? I'm going to go and check out Jesus again. The power of one. Not in the spotlight, not everyone going, whoa, here he comes, or here she comes. You see, the good thing about the kingdom is it's not about male and female, it's about all. In fact, it's about children and adults and elderly people, and wherever you fit in that spectrum, all are created to do good work. And sometimes what we think our good work, we think, oh, well, that's not much. But it's highly important. Highly, highly important for a village to function. We all need to do what we do. Don't sell yourself short. Do not sell yourself short. You, each of you, there are no exceptions. Each of you can make a difference in someone else's life outside of the church and inside the church. For goodness sake, if a church like C3 Hobart can let their drummer wear a Wiggles t-shirt, they can take anybody. Has he never grown up or something? You know. I've never seen an adult wear a Wiggles shirt, but there you go. There's always a first. But he can drum all right. He's a great drummer. He is. Yeah. power of one. The Bible is full of people who weren't maybe significant. Some were. Who the act of obedience, the act of what they were asked to do, changed lives. We see in Jesus uh, that he has an encounter where he's ministering and he's on a hill and he's talking to all these people and people are getting hungry. And so he says to his disciples, you know what? We need to find some food. And in the crowd is a little boy. I like to picture him as a six or seven-year-old boy who's gone up with his mom or maybe he's gone up with himself and he's brought his lunchbox. So he has a six-year-old lunchbox. That's not, that's not a huge lunchbox. He's with a few little pieces of fish and he has some bread in it and he brings it and Jesus says, go and get food. Now, if it was my boys, because they like their food, they would take their lunchbox and they would sit on it and pretend that they haven't brought anything because they do not want to share their food. But this little boy goes and says, well, I don't have much, but you can take mine. A seven-year-old lunchbox that Jesus touches and he feeds 5,000 plus. They say it could probably even have been 8,000 people with this little lunchbox. What would have happened if the little boy had hidden it? One insignificant little boy 
who Jesus stands and does an amazing miracle. And we still talk about that little boy. Esther, a woman who has to make a statement to the king. She has to give him a warning. One woman who knew that if she went in unannounced to go and see the king and give him this message, that most likely, based on what usually happened, she wouldn't even get a word out. It would just be gone, dead. Yet she goes with a message that Mordecai says to her, a message from God, and it says, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. One woman who had the guts to go, I'll do it. And a whole Jewish race was saved. One woman, one person. Noah, build an ark. What's an ark? It's going to rain. What's rain? Water comes down from, okay, I know what water is, but I've never seen this water. It never rained. And he's building an ark. He'd never seen an ark. There were no boats. And people are laughing. People are joking. If you've ever seen Evan Almighty. But yet one man was obedient and he saved humanity from being extinct. One man who had the courage to believe God. And Noah doesn't seem like he was highly significant. He just was Noah. Who was, wor- who was willing to be ridiculed and do what he didn't understand. And then, of course, there's the greatest act by one person. And that was Jesus Christ. One man who it says in the book of um, Romans 5.18, just as one trespass or one sin resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one. One righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. One man. For just as through the disobedience of one man they were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man they were made righteous. Jesus Christ, who loved humanity enough to say, I'll do it. And he changed the trajectory of everyone in this life. And if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, I encourage you, don't leave those doors this morning. Because Jesus died, one man, for you. For you. For you. Acts 4.13, and my time is running out. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Ordinary, unschooled people. One person. And you know what happened? Because they just were them and they used what God had Equip them to be. We see that the early church, and I know you've been talking about this in your series in the book of Acts, that the early church impacted everyone around them because they saw a group of people, they weren't called a church, a group of people who loved each other, who made meals for each other, who'd used what they could for each other, and people said, wow. Not because great leaders that were great leadership in the early church but it was also because everyone played their part as I finish this morning and the musicians can come up there's a story told about an event that happened after World War II and after World War II there were many of the buildings in England that had been bombed and shattered and broken And one particular one was the cathedral. And so some volunteers and others decided that they would rebuild this cathedral that had been bombed. And so they set to work on doing that. And one of the things in the the cathedral, this church, was a statue of Jesus made out of marble. And this statue of Jesus had been, uh, had, was a statue that had his arms out, Jesus with his arms outstretched. And underneath it, it said, come unto me. 
And so they set to work to try and fix this cathedral and fix this statue. And they realised that when they finished, that they had rebuilt it, but they just couldn't fix the hands. And so they made a decision. What are we going to do with those hands? Will we get someone to create new ones or will we just put it back with no hands? And so after consultation, they made a decision. We will leave the statue with no hands. But instead of it saying, come unto me, the plaque at the bottom said this. He has no hands but ours. He has no hands but ours. Your hand. Your hand. Your hand. Your hand. That's what makes a village. That's what makes the community of Jesus Christ. It's when all of us say, I'll do it. Use me. Hey, oh, that's what I'm good at. I love doing that. God is not looking for superstars. He's looking for one. God is not looking for people who the world will say fantastic. He's looking for people who say, how do you want to use me, God? I've got my lunchbox. I've got my lunchbox, God. Take it. Take it. Take it. What are you going to do? How are you going to use your gifting? Are you hiding it like the little boy could have done? Or are you giving it to him? Will you be the one that makes the difference in the life of one or the life of many? You are part of this village. You are important to this village. You are a part of a village that makes a difference to others. Father, I thank you for each person here. Lord, I thank you for the gift that you've put on their life. Lord, I thank you that they're all different. But Lord, I thank you that you have made us to be who we are, that we may be used as your hands. Father, I pray for any person here this morning who is here and Lord heard this message maybe for the first time, has heard it before, but this morning they've said, you know what? I'm sick of being independent. I'm sick of living my life selfishly. I want to be part of something where I can be inputted where I can input and where others can input into me. I don't do this journey alone anymore. Maybe you've been sitting on your hands and this morning you go, right, I need to pick up that phone. I need to scan that QR code. And I'm just going to get involved because I've got something to give. I'm not going to let the past hold me back. I'm not going to let a lack of self-worth hold me back. I am going to let you use me in the way you want me to be used. Holy Spirit, take over this morning. Speak into every life. We love you and we thank you, Lord, that you created us to be who we are. No copies, no cookie cutters, just us. And Lord, as we hand our lives over to you again, we say, here am I. Use me. Use me in this village. Amen.